Hi guys, it's me, Chazzer HD, and welcome to another episode of the podcast where today we are reviewing the events of the United States Grand Prix. A Grand Prix that wasn't as good as I was hoping it was going to be. It was, I mean, the start of the race was absolutely brilliant. We got a couple uh, decent battles between front runners during the race, but it wasn't for the lead of the race like we normally get at the Circuit of the Americas. So it was decent to good i would say the grand prix it wasn't a bad grand prix there's no way you can say that you know if you look at the midfield plenty of battles going on there that were very exciting obviously we had the verstappen norris scrap late on so it wasn't a bad race but it didn't live up to my expectations but maybe my expectations were a little too lofty but in this episode obviously we're going to review how all the teams got on in this grand prix and we'll start of course with the top teams and go through the race winners first ferrari what a race weekend it was for them they didn't look that great to start the weekend in terms of you know they weren't looking as good as they did on sunday they were still good but they weren't looking like the team to beat uh, they were third and fifth i think in sprint qualifying had a very good sprint race, second and fourth they were in that. Carlos Sainz performed superbly in the sprint. Qualifying was as good as it was probably going to be, third and fourth on the grid. I think coming into the weekend they would have been very happy, Ferrari, to uh, come away from qualifying with that result. And then the race was almost perfect for the Scuderia. For Charles Leclerc, the race winner, what a performance by him. The perfect start he pulled off from P4 on the grid. He was P1 on the exit of turn one. And just very smart driving. He let Efron pile in ahead of him into turn one, having their own battles. And then he just swooped underneath and took the lead. It was just such a smart turn one driven by Leclerc. And then after that, except for... Uh, maybe a lap or so of pressure from Max Verstappen after the safety car came in. Leclerc was absolutely dominant. He was, at one point before the uh, his uh, only pit stop of the race, he was like 11 seconds clear of Max Verstappen. He was pulling away half a second per lap. And that's how much quicker Ferrari were than everybody else in Cota. Just incredible pace by Ferrari, but also an incredible performance by Leclerc. And also a great performance by Carlos Sainz. We have to remember that even though he was looking strong to start the race, he did have issues with the power unit, which thankfully were resolved. But he still did well to not lose his head and keep calm and keep within a, a couple seconds or so of Max Verstappen. And then, once he was brought into the pits, did uh, some great... Uh, fast laps out of the pits that got him ahead of Verstappen and then he easily held on to second a just a brilliant performance by Ferrari and we've seen since probably I'd say probably since Hungary right before the summer break Ferrari do tend nowadays to be stronger in the race than they are in qualifying I thought they would have a good race pace but I didn't think it was going to be the best pace of any team and I didn't think they would be half a second per lap quicker than the next best team being Red Bull. Did not see that coming whatsoever and I don't think anyone saw that coming. I thought, you know, again, they would have good race pace but I didn't think it was going to be the best pace or race winnable type pace but credit to them, they were absolutely blisteringly quick in that Grand Prix and with that race pace they have at the minute, I think going forward for the next uh, five races, the last five races of the season, of course, as long as they have a car in the top three on the grid, you've got to say they're a contender to win the race, given their current level of performance on race day. They're just that quick at the moment that you can't count them out, again, if they're in the top three, even maybe top four on the grid. Um, Mexico, obviously last year they did get pole position there, so it'll be interesting to see what they do uh, this time around. But, like I said, if they're top two, top three on the grid, 
You cannot count Ferrari out, whether it's for the Mexico City Grand Prix later this week or the races in Brazil, Vegas, Qatar, or Abu Dhabi. They are definitely contenders to win races uh, going forward for the rest of the year. They're not going to be able to win the Drivers' Championship, unfortunately. Leclerc, even though he scored a lot more points than Verstappen, he's still too far behind. I think the gap's like 79 points between Leclerc and Verstappen. And with five races to go, there's, there's just no way Leclerc is going to uh, close down that gap. But in the Constructors' Championship, Ferrari are 48 points behind McLaren. And as if they can keep winning races... And Carlos Sainz can, you know, keep himself as the second Ferrari driver, you know, in the top three, four consistently. There's no reason why Ferrari can't win the Constructors' Championship. They've got the, you know, they've got a good car. They've got two very good drivers. As long as they remain consistent, there's no reason they can't win the Constructors. I don't think they will. But there is no, you know, we can't sit here and say, oh, absolutely no chance of Ferrari winning the championship. Nobody can sit here and say that. They have absolutely got a chance to win the Constructors. And it's going to be very interesting to see if they can continue to close the gap on McLaren and whether they can actually win their first championship, it would be, in 16 years. 2008 was the last time they won the Constructors' Championship or any championship. Hopefully, Ferrari, you know, soon, whether it's this year, uh, can do it again. But yeah, brilliant from Ferrari. Their first 1-2, by the way, uh, in the United States, I believe, since Indianapolis 2006. Um, so yeah, absolutely brilliant day and weekend for the Ferrari team. And I really cannot wait to see what Leclerc and Ferrari have for us in the final five remaining races of the year. Now, let's go on to Red Bull Racing. Because their weekend, say in the first two days of the weekend, it was playing out maybe as you would have expected. Given they definitely improved the pace of the car. You know, the setup was definitely um, better on that car. And the car was handling definitely a lot better uh, through the weekend. But the way the weekend ended was a massive surprise. None of us thought that was going to happen. That Red Bull would be not just slower than Ferrari, but miles slower than Ferrari. Half a second per lap. That is a lot of lap time to be losing per lap in a Grand Prix and is not something Red Bull are used to um, in, you know, in terms of losing that amount of lap time per lap. But that's the reality of the situation. They, you know, Verstappen at the start of the race dived down the inside of Norris, which was the right thing to do because Lando left the gap there. Went maybe a tad too deep, but I think in his view, he had to to make sure he got the overtake on Norris done, but in doing that, he left a gap wide open for Leclerc, but I know maybe in hindsight you could say, well, maybe he should have not had, uh, had gone as wide as he did to get the position, but I don't think really anyone expected Leclerc to cut underneath the way he did and for it to work as well as it did. So Verstappen's start was was okay, and then, obviously, um, from then on, had a controversial race. And even, you could say, controversial with what he did at the first corner. Um, but then, later on in the first lap, Carlos Sainz went for a dive at turn 12. And Verstappen did have his car ahead, I'm pretty sure, at the apex. I will make sure to post a picture of the uh, of the incident uh, at, on, on the screen now, if I can. And yeah, I'm pretty sure Verstappen was ahead and then Sainz just went too deep and Verstappen was, I believe, pushed off the track. So I think Verstappen was fair in reclaiming his position because I don't think Carlos Sainz fairly um, reclaimed, or not reclaimed, but you know, fairly overtook, or really you know, properly overtook Max Verstappen there. And then Verstappen, you know, got into second and then, as I, as I said, 
during the first stint. Lost half a second a lap to Leclerc. Carlos Sainz was still a couple seconds behind. And then Sainz was brought in by Ferrari for the undercut. And Verstappen in the Red Bull decided to go a few laps longer to have fresher tyres. They did that. They came out. And even on fresher tyres, they were lapping slower than Sainz in the Ferrari. Which is quite remarkable around a circuit where fresh tyres normally does give you quite an advantage. So, I don't know what was wrong with the Red Bull car on the hard compound tyres, but they had no pace whatsoever. Absolutely no pace at all. And that's why Lando Norris was able to catch up and have a go at passing Max Verstappen uh, when McLaren themselves were pretty slow in the race. They were the third fastest team, really. Um, the only reason, really, they started catching up to Max Verstappen in the second half of the race is because Lando had fresher tyres and Red Bull were having some sort of issues on those hard tyres um, you know, during the second half of the Grand Prix. But Lando, with the much fresher tyres, caught up and... Had some half goes at Verstappen, but he never really could get his car far enough ahead to actually go for the for the proper overtake. And then we came uh, come to when he actually had a proper go, and it was down into turn twelve, and he had his car ahead around the outside. But then Verstappen dived to the inside, and when you get to the apex, you'll see, and I'll try and put a picture on screen if I can. Verstappen and Norris were pretty much level. Um, at the apex and then Verstappen you know he, he took the inside line um, and Lando clearly overtook Verstappen off the track if you go and watch the footage back it's better obviously to watch the footage of the incident but I can't show it because of copyright uh, reasons Norris drove off the track to overtake Verstappen there is absolutely no doubt about it when you watch it back that is clear to see was Verstappen a bit too aggressive in diving down the inside? Maybe. Yeah, you could say that. But the rules are the rules. And I think the stewards, in this case, applied the rules correctly. I think Lando did overtake Max off the track. And I don't think Lando was pushed off. Now, that's not to say the stewards got it right with every incident in the race. For example, George Russell's um, penalty for pushing Valtteri Bottas off the track, was not, in my view, a penalty. That was a very, very harsh penalty. Um, I, I don't see how he pushed Valtteri Bottas off. He, he got the move done, and Bottas, yeah, he went off, but he was never going to really, you know, repass Russell. And Russell had the line, and it was up to Bottas to back out it, as far as I'm concerned. So I don't know why they gave Russell a penalty for that. But... For me, again, with Lando Norris, he clearly overtook Verstappen off the track. And one thing I do want to say, because I have seen online after the race that people are saying, well, you know, if Russell, you know, if what he did to Bottas was a penalty, then why isn't what Verstappen maybe did to Norris a penalty? Now, in terms of consistency, I completely understand that argument, but I don't think Russell's what Russell did was a penalty. Therefore, I don't think what Verstappen is alleged to have done should have been a penalty either. So, yeah, I can understand the argument of, well, you know, if they're going to be consistent, then that's the way they need to rule it. I would rather them try to just be consistently correct rather than be consistently wrong just to be consistent. If you know what I mean. I would rather that than, you know, just consistently being wrong but being consistent nonetheless. Because the more so, you know, the stewards get it correct, then the more so it helps us get to what the, you know, correct race results should be. And we have to remember, at the end of the day, the stewards, they're not going to get it right every single time. They do get a few things wrong. But I think... If you look at this season, I think most incidents they've had to, um, you know, have had to judge on, I think most of them they've got correct. And I think most of the time they do get 
decisions correct, but there are some races, yeah, where the, where where they don't get it correct. And again, this Grand Prix was one of them where George Russell should not have got a penalty for uh, pushing apparently Valtteri Bottas off the track, but. Lando Norris fairly, in my view, got a five-second penalty, and luckily for Verstappen, he was still uh, within five seconds, just about, of Lando Norris, and was able to retake the position, and Verstappen finishing in third, ahead of Lando Norris, and in my view, at this point, the Drivers' Championship battle is now over. Max is now 57 points clear. I'll obviously show the championship standings later on. Max, yeah, 57 points clear of Lando Norris. Five races to go, including, I think, is it two sprint races? It might be. Um, yeah, there's no way Lando Norris is is going to beat Max Verstappen to the, to the championship. I think I saw someone on X say that Lando, I think now, needs to outscore Max by 11 points a race if he's going to win the championship in Abu Dhabi. And that, you know, 11 points a race basically means that Lando has to win every race if Max finishes every race in third, and Lando also needs to take the fastest lap. We know Lando is not going to win every race between now and the end of the season, and Max, I think eventually Max will win a race, because Red Bull, I think, will eventually have good enough pace to to, you know, to win a race on Sunday. Um and then, but you know, with Ferrari in there as well, taking points away from from you know McLaren as well. Uh, yeah, I just don't see it as possible that Lando Norris can can win the championship at this point. So, congratulations to Max Verstappen. He is going to be your four-time world champion and will be the world champion in either Las Vegas or Qatar. I think they, those will be. Uh, either one of those races will be the uh, place where Max officially becomes world champion. Uh, so we'll see where he ends up winning it. And um, yeah, uh, great season from Max Verstappen, of course, in terms of his own driving. To keep consistently getting good enough results despite not having uh, the best car a lot of the time. And yeah, uh, definitely the deserving world champion champion but let's go on to McLaren and really Lando Norris because Oscar Piastri did nothing in this race and there's not really um you know that's not really something that I'm gonna criticize him for because his pace in the race wasn't actually that bad he was only a few seconds behind Norris for the entire race really um and Lando is quicker around this track so it's not really a criticism McLaren also, we have to remember, were not that quick this weekend. I know they were on pole, but I think that was a bit of a lucky pole position, to be honest. But with Lando Norris, even though, from his point of view, if you are a Lando Norris fan, yes, you could argue he was unlucky or um, you know, maybe Max Verstappen should have been penalised here or there. From my point of view... This race was a very good example of Lando Norris's lack of quality in racing wheel to wheel with other elite drivers, and well, namely Max Verstappen. At the start, and it still pisses me off, to, you know, to right now, seeing it back, but the start of the race, what he did was unforgivable, as far as I'm concerned. Now, if you go back and watch the start of the sprint race, Max Verstappen provided a great lesson in how to, you know, get away from pole and keep your position. If you look at Verstappen at the start of the sprint race, he got a good start, but then he immediately and aggressively covered the inside line because he knows how um, important that inside line is for second place to try and make a move for the lead. And it was a great start by Verstappen that he made in the sprint. And then obviously Verstappen went on to win comfortably. Lando Norris had a good start. But then he came across to cover the inside line. And I was thinking at the time, right, he's going he's gonna to do what Max did. But he didn't do what Max did. He half-heartedly covered the inside line and left a clear gap that Verstappen was always going to take. And then... 
Uh, I, I have seen some Norris fans complain that, oh, Verstappen pushed him off at turn one. I don't think he did. I think Lando, you know, the move, Max Verstappen had got the move done on Lando on the inside line and Lando just refused to get out of it when I think if he did get out of it, it probably would have benefited him better than trying to drive off the track to keep his position. That's how I saw the incident. Let me know how you saw it. But again, unforgivable, absolutely unforgivable to leave Verstappen the inside line. Another example of a driver doing this and paying the price was Charles Leclerc back in Austria in 2019. I don't know if you guys remember that. But late on in that race, up to turn three, Leclerc did the same thing, basically, that Norris did. Came over to defend, but it was a half-hearted defence. He didn't defend the inside line properly. And then Verstappen went for the inside and took the lead and ended up winning the race. And Leclerc learnt his lesson and is much better in defending his position since then. I've not seen him lose position in that type of way where he should have defended better. He he has improved, absolutely, in that area. With Lando, again, just piss poor defence. If you're going to defend to the inside, do it properly. Don't half-heartedly do it. It's, you know, Martin Brundle... It's one of the, uh, I think it's something he, he, he said quite a few times over the years. You know, don't do what is basically what would be in football, a half-hearted tackle. If you're going to tackle in football, you know, do it properly. And it's the same thing when you're defending your position. Don't do it half-heartedly or don't try and overtake half-heartedly. Go for it properly. But Lando didn't do that. He half-heartedly put his car in the middle of the track, thought that was enough, and then Verstappen obviously went for the inside line and took the uh, position. And Lando Norris, in the end, ended up going from first down to fourth. Horrible start, and quite frankly, for his poor defence, he deserved it. And then, towards the end of the race with Verstappen, he had a few goes at Verstappen, but didn't have enough of his car really ahead to have the momentum to properly try and overtake. But then when we came to, you know, the incident where Norris overtook off track, Norris had a lot of momentum around the outside. Verstappen, you know, then dive-bombed back up the inside, which he, you know, he... People might not like it, but within the rules, Max is able to do that, as are other drivers. And then they were pretty much 50-50 at the apex. And then Lando decided to just drive off the track to overtake him. And then complain afterwards that he was pushed off. And then ended up getting a five-second penalty for it. When I think even Ted Kravitz and even I think Anthony Davidson, even the Sky F1 might have said it afterwards. And I totally agree. And I even said it at the time on my race watch along that what Lando should have done is given the position back and try to re-overtake. Because... Red Bull was slow at that point. Lando definitely could have passed him fairly if he had led him through and tried again. But Lando made his decision and ended up costing him. Um, and with that incident, you know, with the, you know, turn 12 late on in the race, again, showing something that we saw back in Austria with Lando, where back in Austria, fighting for the lead with Verstappen, very similar, uh, um, you know, type of um, uh, type of battle, really. In the even though it wasn't fight for uh, the win here in uh, at, at, at Cota, Lando clearly had the faster car, had multiple chances to overtake, yet failed continuously to do it in a fair and proper way. And then eventually, obviously, in Austria, they crashed. But here, Lando just decided to overtake off the track, clearly, and then not give the position back. Lando Norris, absolutely, and I don't think it can be even debated at this point, he is not good enough in wheel-to-wheel -wheel combat to beat Max Verstappen. He has got to improve when it comes to wheel-to-wheel -to -wheel combat. The thing is, though is given how old Lando is and how long he's been racing for, I'm not sure he can improve that much 
on his skills when it comes to racing wheel to wheel. The only thing he can do is just be more aggressive, which I think to a degree would help, but not necessarily would see a full improvement in that area. So, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure whether improvements, you know, big improvements can be made, but there is no doubt for me at this point, Lando Norris is not good enough in wheel to wheel combat. We saw it back in Austria, not just in the race, but the sprint race there in Austria that Lando, you know, multiple chances to overtake, but he failed continuously. And then here at the Circuit of the Americas, you know, he, he just, you know, didn't really do anything to properly trouble Verstappen when they were racing wheel to wheel. And then, you know, when it comes to the incident got himself briefly ahead into the braking zone, but then when they got to the apex, Verstappen got himself alongside. And then Norris just decided to drive off the track and overtake because I think at that point he almost didn't want to continue racing Verstappen. So that's, you know, what he decided um, to do. So, yeah, Lando, another... I wouldn't say race weekend, but another race where he could have absolutely done better. Again, defending the inside line at turn one and then, you know, not letting Verstappen back through uh, to have another go at overtaking properly uh, towards the end of the race. Norris definitely cost himself at least three points in this race, maybe more. Because if Norris had defended his lead into the first quarter properly he probably would have led at the end of the first lap. And if he's leading at the end of the first lap, does he win the race? I don't think so, given how quick Ferrari were. But he might have finished in second ahead of Carlos Sainz. So, could have had an extra six points. Again, points on offer that Lando failed to take. And that's why. He is not going to be world champion. I know he, you know, he'll keep coming out and saying, "But oh, McLaren, we've not actually had the best car this year," which is absolute rubbish. I, I, I think, I think most people would agree McLaren have probably had the best car for the majority of this year. Not the whole year, of course, but no, they've had a good enough car to win a lot of races this year. And Lando only has three wins this year, which is nowhere near enough if you're going to win the championship. You need to be winning seven or eight races in a season, at least, if you're going to win the championship, especially against someone like Max Verstappen. Three race wins is nowhere near enough. But that's the way it is. And McLaren, even though they're in the lead of the Constructors' Championship, now under threat from Red Bull and Ferrari behind. So they still need to keep pushing on because they don't want to be losing the Constructors' Championship as well because that would be a miserable end to what has been a still a good season considering, you know, they've made obviously a big jump up in performance from last year where they were fighting for podiums and this year where they've been fighting for and winning Grand Prix. Um, the last top team we'll go on to, Mercedes-Benz. What awful weekend. It started off so well, though. They looked so quick on Friday. You could argue they were the quickest team on Friday. Then the sprint race happened. They really burned their tyres out quite a bit, and they were really slow for most of that sprint race. And then qualifying, even George Russell said on the radio he had no idea why the car felt so different from Friday to Saturday. And they were literally on lap time slower than they were on Friday which is nowhere near good enough for you know for Mercedes Benz. Um and then George Russell obviously had his crash at the end of uh, Q3. And then in the race, obviously Lewis Hamilton went spinning out on the uh was it the second lap of the Grand Prix. Um Lewis did complain of setup issues with the um with the car and apparently wanted to start from the pit lane so he could fix his setup but apparently was told no again i'm saying apparently because i don't know if that is confirmed but if it is if that is true then i don't know what mercedes are on you know not starting hamilton from the pit lane um and then for george russell great drive he did the best he could 
despite the five second penalty, still finished in P6. Fantastic drive, got the best possible result he could have. Um, and I am I uh, not disappointed in George Russell's weekend, but I do feel sorry for him because if the car had remained as quick as it was on Friday throughout the whole weekend, he could have been contending for the win. He really could have. He was so quick on Friday, and so was Lewis Hamilton, who was very unlucky this race weekend. So, yeah, a lot to ponder for Mercedes, and hopefully not as chaotic a weekend in Mexico. But honestly, in Mexico, I I don't see them being competitive when it comes to fighting for pole of the race win. Maybe they could snatch a podium if their race pace is decent enough, but... I don't see them fighting at the front. Absolutely not. Um, I think the next time you're going to see them competitive is maybe Sao Paulo if we got some changeable weather. But Las Vegas in the dry, because they do tend to be a lot quicker Mercedes in cooler conditions, I, th I think Las Vegas will be a, a race weekend where they should theoretically be competitive. So watch out for them there, but... Yeah, this next Grand Prix, I don't see Mercedes doing much of anything. Um, but other great performances out there. Obviously, Nico Hulkenberg finishing 8th on a one-stop strategy. Great performance by him as Haas continued to pull away from racing balls in the championship. Liam Lawson. What a return to Formula 1. Started 19th because of grid penalties and then finished 9th. Top drive from Liam Lawson and... Proving that he deserves absolutely to be on the grid. And so does, on a full-time basis, Franco Colapinto. He started 15th and in a similar way to Lawson. Went very long on the hard compound tyres. And then pitted late for mediums. And that strategy, you have to say, of starting on the hard compound tyre really worked well for the people that did it. Obviously, George Russell did that as well. And yeah, Colapinto also finishing in the points. So Colapinto, um, I think since he's come into Formula 1, he's outscored his own teammate, which is quite incredible. He scored five points, Colapinto, um, in the, what, four now races he's done. That is just, again, incredible. Because you have to remember, he's in a Williams, which is one of the probably three to four slowest on the grid. So it's not like they're expected to score points. So yeah, that is just incredible. And please, Sauber, get him in your car. He is clearly a Formula One caliber driver. Just get him signed up, please. Uh, but yeah, those are all the uh, you know the great performances from the midfield and all the uh, the the headlines really from the Sunday Grand Prix at the Circuit of the Americas. Obviously, I'll flash up on screen your uh, championship standings as we now go into. The Mexico City Grand Prix. Uh, just to remind you guys, as we've come to the end of this podcast, I will be going live at 8.30pm UK time on Saturday night for the qualifying watch along for the Mexico City Grand Prix. But I will not be doing the race watch along. The reason is because the uh, Mexico City Grand Prix is normally pretty boring, but also... Because I'm at university and this is a triple header we're in, because obviously we've got Mexico this week and then Brazil next week, trying to keep myself fresh enough for the triple header and the remaining races in general. So yeah, I won't be doing the race watch along, but this time next week, the day after the Mexico City Grand Prix, of course, there'll be a podcast reviewing that race and race weekend. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys for coming along for this podcast reviewing the US Grand Prix. Let me know in the comments section what you thought of all the incidents of the US Grand Prix, whether you think I'm right, um, or you know, just give me your view in general as to what you thought about what happened in the United States Grand Prix. And until my qualifying watch along this Saturday, live at 8.30pm UK time, guys, it has been me, Chazer HD. Goodbye. <laughs>